All right. Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Eat Better Food Today. I'm your host, Ken Cunahan, and I'm excited to be sharing insights on why we believe that health and longevity begins with the food we eat. The goal of this podcast will be to inspire, educate, and enable folks to live a healthier life and do it affordably. My wife and I have been on this journey for over 10 years and continue to work on it every single day. Percent of the profits from this podcast will be put towards child hunger, with an initial focus on the poor suburb in America, East Cleveland, Ohio, which, by the way, we just got approval to uh, go out and start raising funds for that center uh, on Monday. Um, as a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast. Be sure to visit my website, Eat Better Food Today, for links to this show, videos, recipes, books, and articles that our guests provide. On this episode, we're grateful to have Corbett Nash from the Monterey Bay Aquarium and Sharon Palmer from Food and Planet. Corbett is an advocate for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. Previously, he steered the communication strategy and delivery on large international initiatives around climate change, nature-based solutions, restoration, and natural resource governance. Sharon is an award-winning writer, blogger, author, speaker, and professor. Sharon's expertise is in plant-based nutrition, cooking, and sustainability. She has authored over a thousand articles in publications like the LA Times, Oprah, Better Homes and Gardens, and many others. She has written several books and is co-founder of the nonprofit organization Food and Planet. In this episode, we'll explore Corbett and Sharon's thoughts on food, health, and longevity and, content- and discuss what continues to inspire them. Welcome, Corbett. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Nice so, to be here. Thank you. So I'm always into first question I usually ask range uh, ranges around breakfast. It's still relatively early where you're at in California, um, and I believe it sets a tone for a healthy day. But I get very interesting answers. Some people just have coffee. Some people have full breakfast. So I'm just curious what the both of you uh, had for breakfast this morning. Well, I like to have a smoothie every day. I make kind of an antioxidant smoothie with a cup of coffee. That's my go-to. Very nice. I had a, this morning was a bit unusual, Uh, I usually have a (laughs) bowl of granola, but this morning I had a peanut butter and jelly on uh, on, uh, multi-grain toast and a cup of coffee. Nice. So you're getting some, uh, that's that's good, it's not just a coffee breakfast, it's some nutrition there to kind of, kind of get started. I usually do a shake in the morning as well, although I put the the blender away and I'm kind of just going to yogurt and mixing everything together by hand. So we'll see what next week brings. So can you to kind of start out here, I guess, for the listeners, I, I've probably mentioned to a couple dozen people in Cleveland anyways, that I'm going to be having this conversation with you today. And I mentioned the Monterey Bay Aquarium and with the exception of Doug Katz, Corbett, nobody knows what the Monterey Bay Aquarium is. So if just, I guess if we can start with just some background on the aquarium when it was founded, why it was founded, I think that would be helpful for everybody. Absolutely. So the aquarium is celebrating its 40th year this year. Um, so uh, back in the mid 80s, uh, there was um, uh, there was really no way for people to um, really get in touch with the ocean apart from going into the ocean. And it's really hard to see what's what's down there, what's living, what our coasts provide here, which is an abundance of, of nature. There's, there's sea otters and there's fish and there's kelp forests and there's abalone and there's an amazing his, history of, of fishing uh, as well as just uh, an abundance of natural life down there. And so um, the, uh, the Packard family um, purchased some uh, canneries that were sardine canneries that were, um, and that were out of business. They were defunct and just sort of sitting there kind of white elephants on the on the coast at the time and they transformed them into a place where they could uh, uh, create a a world of the sea that was just right next door so that everyone could see it and everyone could experience it um, and that and they did that 40 years ago and it's been very successful um, in bringing people a little bit closer to understanding and appreciating natural resources inspiring awe and actually their mission is to inspire conservation of the ocean. And an extension of that 25 years ago was the founding of the Seafood Watch program. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more history if, if you'd like to about that. Uh, but yes, the Seafood uh, Watch program 
is essentially um, uh, it's a it's a it came from an exhibit in 1997 where uh, we were just talking about um, you know the sustainability so the sustainability environmentally speaking of different seafoods that people commonly eat shrimp salmon you know, what have you um, because we 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 noticed some real problems uh, in in fisheries and in aquaculture operations and uh, wanted to let people know that hey there there is an issue here so next time you 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 know put your fork into a piece of whatever piece of that seafood is you're eating maybe give it a couple thoughts uh, about what you're eating where it comes from and, and what the impact is on the environment and so we put out these little cards um, in 1997 on on the cafe tables that said you know okay salmon you know we, we have these feelings about salmon or we have these feelings about this fish and that fish um, based on the science that we've been able to, to piece together well those cards went missing people were just taking them off the tables um, because they were so popular and we realized that there is a lack of knowledge here about seafood sustainability two years later so 25 years ago um, we started the seafood watch program which is a, a program that uh, uses um, science to assess the environmental sustainability of seafood products on the US market and then we use those those findings to help transform how seafood is fished and farmed so can you give us like an example on the kind of what that means I mean from so if I'm going into a so I guess first of all the seafood watch is that available is that information available I know it's online on your website but is it available in any of the grocery stores where you would buy seafood or is it just do you have to look up on how, how do you access that information I guess well there's different ways to access it um, mm -hmm. we so basically we take we take we're a ratings program and so we've done thousands of ratings of different uh, seafood uh, wild caught and farmed uh, operations uh, across across the world actually but we really look at what comes into the US market and um, we, we assess those fisheries and against our standards, our science-based standards for environmental sustainability, and then we create um, uh, recommendations for wild-caught and farmed seafood. And that's really what we're getting at here is the recommendations part. Mm -hmm. So we make recommendations based on a stoplight system, green, yellow, red, um, green being good, and we'll get to that. Uh, and red being uh, seafood that you want to take a pass on for now, yellow kind of being in that middle area, some issues. And we, we have a, one of the most famous things we're, we're known for are these little pocket guides. Uh, and we've distributed, and the little pocket guides have, oh, about 20 in the green list, 20 on the red, and 20 in the yellow. And we try to make them regionally specific uh, and very up to date with our latest science and understanding of these fisheries and policy around these fisheries and sources of stock and things like that. Um, and we've distributed those far and wide through zoos and aquariums, um, through our, our chef's program called the Blue Ribbon Task Force, um, through lots of other um, opportunities. And we've distributed about 60, 60 million of those cards, um, more or less, mm -hmm. over the years. Of course, we're transforming a little bit to more digital distribution of that information now. Mm -hmm. um, we also partner with um, a number of large businesses uh, that help spread the sustainability messages that, that we want to get out there, uh, like Whole Foods Market, for example. Um, uh, th there are a number of others as well. Um, and so they, they, uh, they help spread those messages as well. So we, we, we attack it. We approach it, I should say, from a lot of different, um, a lot of different angles, from consumers, from businesses, from seafood sourcers and buyers, all the way to producers. Okay, yeah, I notice when I go to a Whole Foods, they've got little cards in front of every piece of fish there, and they talk about where it's from, and it's got the kind of the color coding that you're talking about, and farm raised, wild caught, et cetera. So it's helpful to me. So. It's much appreciated. So what, I guess, what is that, when you talk about the, the science behind it, what, what does that mean? I mean, if, if I'm going to, and I know, Sharon, you provided a recipe we're going to talk about at the end, and albacore tuna is in that recipe, but what, what does that mean, I guess? So, you know, albacore tuna A versus B, I mean, how do you decide, you know, and how do you decide as an organization, I guess, what's a, a piece of healthy albacore tuna from a, 
health standpoint, a mercury standpoint, a sustainability standpoint, et cetera? I guess how, how does that happen? Well, I'll, I'll give you the overview. For, for more detail, please come to seafoodwatch.org <laughs> and look at our, look at our, um, look at our information on there in, in, in our standards, and you, sure. can, you could get sure. it all. But on a very high level, um, we assess fisheries and we assess aquaculture operations, and we assess them differently because they are very different kinds mm -hmm. of uh, production facilities or uh, methods. So for the wild-caught seafood, we look at four different criteria. We look at the source of the stock, and so we'll analyze um, various stock reports by government agencies usually, uh, but other, other academic um, information on that. We look at um, the unintentional catch of other species, so bycatch um, mm -hmm. typically, and what impacts that bycatch has on the ecosystems. Uh, then we look at the management and enforcement of that management that are in place in that particular fishery. So what are the policies set up? Are those policies enforceable? Are those policies adequate to, um, uh, to observe the, the st stock status and using the latest science? And then we also look at how that fishery is affecting the overall environment and ecosystem. So uh, if, they're, you know, if they're running nets or dredging along a sea floor, what is that doing to the sea floor? Is, that, is it having a big impact? Um, things of that nature. And so that's what we look at for, for fisheries. And for aquaculture, we have, I won't go into all of them, but we, we look at the source of the stock, where are they getting their juveniles, what's their waste management look like for their water, what feed are they using, and wh how does that feed impact the environment, um, you know, disease, pathogens, things like that. Okay. All right, thank you. So how does this lead? So now we you've got a you've talked about Monterey Bay, you've talked about the Seafood Watch, and now you've got this new program called Super Green, which um, also involves a university, Tufts University. So can you maybe explain a little bit about how that came to be as well? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is our 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. For our, I believe it was our 10th anniversary, we and this is before my time, mm -hmm. but we made a list. It's a little bit different from what we're doing now, and we call this Super Green. And it was basically um, seafood that is both um, environmentally sustainable in our in our view. So it gets a green rating, mm -hmm. um, and it's good for you. And we partnered uh, with with some of the, some some similar uh, institutions at the time. Uh, it was Harvard and, and another uh, to help us with the nutrition side of the the seafood because you know frankly we are a, you know we're an environmental sustainability organization and our expertise does not uh, typically go to nutrition um, and but we've been finding that uh, more and more people really want to know about is this seafood healthy and how healthy is it and what can it do for me and they come to us sometimes and we we need to be able to answer we want to be able to answer their questions but we, like I said we don't have the in-house expertise so that's why for the 25th anniversary, just for this year, we reignited the Super Green program, and we thought, okay, well, we got to find somebody that can that can help us with the nutrition and health side, and that's where Sharon's team came in. We reached out to Food and Planet, uh, and also uh, to a, a, an individual we work with at Tufts, um, uh, but with Food and Planet, we um, decided to uh, launch this campaign for the year, uh, make sure that we are. Uh, fully in sync with nutritional and, and environmental sustainability aspects of each of these seafoods. And um, it's been a great partnership so far, and we're looking forward to continuing it through the rest of the year. Very nice. Sharon, what, with that intro, why don't you kind of explain a little bit about Food and Planet and kind of your, I guess, new relationship with the Monterey Bay Aquarium here? Yes. Uh, so Food and Planet is a group of four registered dietitians that founded the nonprofit and our uh, mission is to empower healthcare professionals, in particular nutrition professionals like dietitians, to advance sustainable food systems. Because uh, surveys show that consumers really trust health professional voices. Like we're the number one a trusted voice when it comes to nutrition and shopping and cooking and eating advice. But yet, uh, dietitians really aren't learning uh, enough about sustainability in our in our curriculum, in our educational uh, settings. 
And in fact, this is true among all healthcare professionals. We just don't have that uh, basis in, in our learning. So we're really bringing that knowledge to, um, to the healthcare professional field. And we're just really excited to partner with Seafood Watch. Um, as a registered dietitian for more than 25 years, I've been, I have been using Seafood Watch with my clients for years. You know, that was just my go-to when I would talk about healthy seafood. I would tell them, go get the little um, guide that Cor Corbett was talking about, um, you know, and, and use that to make the choices because those are healthy choices, but they're also more sustainable. So we're really encouraging people when they're talking about healthy, to, it just should fold in sustainability. It should just be part of that message. So uh, we've been working with Seafood Watch this year to provide nutrition fact sheets for each of the species on the super green list. We're also uh, working with our team of culinary dietitians that we're, we partner with from across the U.S. in many different food ways and cultural traditions to develop these amazing recipes and actual videos, cooking videos that go with each species. So when you check out the super green list, you'll see the species, whether it's albacore tuna one month and you'll see uh, a beautiful recipe that was developed by a dietitian and a video in which she's preparing it. And then we're also providing, providing um, you know, consumers with those nutrition facts about that particular uh, species, how you can cook with it, and just a little bit more information on it. Very nice. Yeah, and I think, so we'll talk about the recipe at the end here, but it looks like so far you have on the Super Green website, you've got farm mussels, the albacore tuna, which we've talked about, Rainbow trout, farmed seaweed, which uh, is an interesting one, and uh, Alaska flounder was the latest released. So, mm -hmm. how does seaweed? Uh, my wife eats all this seafood, but when it comes to seaweed, it's not something that uh, a lot of people find uh, appetizing. But it's very good for you. So, any, just any comments about the seaweed selection there? I guess. Yeah, I was really excited that they featured it because we're really trying to encourage consumption of seaweed. Uh, you know, it's been part of traditional diets around the world for eons. Um, it's, you know, famously part of many Asian food ways, but also in, um, like in Scotland and Ireland, it's consumed in Scandinavia. The Native Americans uh, uh, consumed it. So it was this plentiful food that was available, very nutritious, very sustainable, uh, and it's, we're really trying to encourage consumption of that because it is such a su sustainable food. Um, so we do, did cover it in uh, the super green list one month and provided a recipe for a tofu sandwich that has seaweed in it. So it kind of gives it that savory umami seafood taste. So this is really great for people who are wanting to eat more plant-based diets. They can include that seaweed to get that kind of um, sea, sea taste that you're, that you're wanting to include. Very nice. I mean, what? so what, what are your thoughts, I guess, either one of you for this question, get, trying to get people to eat healthier foods? Like we're talking about here, we're talking about seafood. A lot of people, I, don't, I won't say a lot of people, many people don't like seafood or seaweed. So how, how do you encourage more people? I know anything personally, and, and I do have like the, the seafood watch list. I've had it on my phone forever. So, um, but not everybody's like me. So... What what can be done, I guess, to encourage more people to, to entertain what we're talking about here? Well, I can weigh in a little bit that, you know, it is, you're right that pe some people find uh, the taste strong or uh, something that they may not be familiar with. But, um, you know, we try to encourage the benefits. I think that's one thing the nutrition field has been uh, really cognizant of and promoting over the last several years because more and more research is showing that seafood is part of a healthy eating pattern. It's part of many tr healthy traditional diets, such as uh, the Mediterranean diet famously, but also the Japanese traditional diet. Um, so, uh, you know, about a couple servings a week is part of a healthy eating pattern, and it's recommended by the dietary guidelines. It has, you know, of course it has protein and iron and zinc, but it also has omega-3 fatty acids, which is really where those benefits, you know, a lot of those benefits are coming from. So it's one of your healthier animal proteins uh, on your plate. So really showing those benefits, but also showing people approachable, easy ways uh, to prepare them, I think is a real key. We, we've found in our work with uh, consumer research that a lot of times when people just don't know how to prepare it, that is the major barrier. 
So just showing them it doesn't have to be fancy. It's not something that you only eat at a restaurant. You can prepare it at home. Like for example, we have a pizza recipe that's really popular that has mussels on it. Um, mm. But and just canned mussels, you know, just something as easy as adding adding that on top of a pizza or pasta or even um, a, a sandwich, you know. So really trying to show these accessible ways that people can approach them. So uh, you mentioned that you have kind of the the recipes and then the cooking videos for the super green products out there. So do, is there, do you have resources as well for just seafood cooking in general? Um, we, uh, we do have those available uh, upon request. I don't think we're listing them currently on the super green list, but... Um, you know, those are, you know, something that we can offer at any time. I don't know if, if you have those, Corbett, um, that you're referring to. Uh, what, could you be more specific, Ken, what you're looking for? I, I guess I'm just thinking of, so for the podcast and then on my website, I will post uh, resource information. So, I mean, I'll post, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, of course, Seafood Watch, Super Green, but just outside of the super green list. So Sharon mentioned she has like cooking videos to kind of, so ex has a recipe with an, you know, a video to explain how to prepare those foods. So I guess my question is, is there a broader, is there, uh, do, do you have it, does Sharon have it, does somebody have it where you can go to a website and say, I want to cook, you know, something on the seafood watch list, on the green list, and I want to make, you know, XYZ recipe they can see. Because I think you're right, Sharon. I think the people don't know how to prepare seafood. I think that's definitely an impediment here. So, mm -hmm. Well, we do have, you know, the featured recipe for each month on the super green list. Right. And that's where the video is. Um, I know that some of my favorite resources is Old Ways, which is a, a really great nonprofit organization that has, uh, they, you know, they do a lot of work with traditional diets, including the Mediterranean diet, and they have a lot of amazing uh, seafood recipes. Um, uh, so, and of course, there are lots of great cookbooks out there too, but I don't know if you have any favorite references, Corbett, uh, in terms of seafood recipes. Uh, no, I don't think I do, actually. Okay. <laughs> it's just all innate to Corbett. That's right. <laughs> they're, all, they're all good. <laughs> I think we, the, I think you're right. It's, it's something that is exciting. We, we also, Food and Planet also worked on a project called Eat Aquatic Foods, and there's free recipes there. Um, we created a Blue Foods cookbook really looking at um, bivalves and sea vegetables. So that would mm -hmm. be your seaweeds and then things like um, mussels, clams, oysters, and scallops. Um, and there, there's a whole collection of recipes there. You can get that at eataquaticfoods.org. Really okay. trying to promote m more of these sustainable uh, seafood options. Okay. All right. I'll post that as part of the podcast in the notes. Thank you. <laughs> and we, so, um, we also have, uh, so we have a recipe attached to every one of these super green seafoods. Oh, yep. God, this is just 10. We have five <laughs> out right now. Yep. And there are five more that will come out through the end of the year. So check back every month and, uh, and see what, uh, what we're talking about. Absolutely. So how about in the in the sea, in the sustainability space? Uh, microplastics keep coming up a lot in conversations. As far as they're in, they seem to be in everything, and they seem to be in our bodies as well. Any comments about how, I guess, Corbett or Sharon, that you know the whole microplastic, unfortunate situation that exists? I know everybody should be using glass or you know drinking out of something recyclable versus a, a plastic item. But uh, what what are your thoughts here as it relates to seafood? Uh, I can start on that, um, share my perspective. Um, you're right, it's a big issue. Uh, it's not just limited to seafood, it's in our whole food system. And uh, it's a result of so much, so much plastic contamination in our environment. Um, so this is really an emerging issue. In my view, we really don't have enough research available in terms of like what those acceptable safe levels are yet. So it's really hard to make recommendations and most experts that are looking at this issue are they're still saying that the benefits outweigh the risks for consuming you know moderate uh those good choices of seafood that that we were talking about earlier so um one of the things to look at is also some of the the US farmed seafood is showing that it has uh lower levels because you have more control over the environment in terms of the water and the you know the pollution levels of that environment it seems to be 
associated with the actual location, the ge geographic location, that water source when we're looking at seafood. So I think it's something um, right now, making those best choices that we have, you know, consuming, you know, that two servings a week um, is really where we're at right now until we learn more. Yeah, and I noticed on the kind of the lists that you have, uh, Corbett, that you do have some farmed. I guess I was surprised. I just assumed everything green would be wild caught or, you know, in that category. But you actually have some farmed fish recommendations from the uh, the programs. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, uh, uh, aquaculture is here and it's here to stay. And it's <laughs> something that if we want to continue to eat seafood and have enough protein to, to feed everyone, we're, we're probably going to need to embrace. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it doesn't mean it hasn't had a bit of a murky past and even some practices today are, are unacceptable um, but there are a lot of good examples of, of solid aquaculture as well uh, where it's being done with the environment in mind um, generally speaking uh, I agree with Sharon I can't speak specifically to microplastics but um, generally speaking when it comes to environmental sustainability U.S. aquaculture, for example, is, is doing quite a good job. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, we have mostly green and some yellow ratings for U.S. aquaculture, but I, you know, you're, you're going to be tough to find too many red, um, red ratings for U.S. aquaculture. Um, we really do a good job of regulation in this country, both in aquaculture and in our fisheries. But also we have to keep in mind that um, some 85 to 90 percent of our seafood is imported. Um, mm. which, which surprises a lot of people because yeah, you see these fish and boats and we have, you know, yeah. we have these traditions, but we actually import most of our seafood. Um, and, you know, environmental regulations and um, pro policy and practice is different uh, in different countries. And so uh, sort of keeping an eye out for that and knowing where your food come from, comes from uh, is a big part of understanding the sustainability of it. So how about on uh, is people? So we've got kind of the criteria that you have. So kind of recommendations. People that are on a budget and want to share. And to your point, you know, want to buy seafood. Say have it for dinner two or three days a week. What 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 are your recommendations or just thoughts on? I'll say affordable seafood. That's a great question because affordability is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different forms of of seafood that fit in all different types of budgets. Um, and it also comes in many forms that gives you more options. For example, you can get many uh, seafood options in canned. You can get some of it in dried form. You can get it fresh and frozen. A lot of times fresh will be your most expensive option. Um, frozen is a really great option because it's super easy. It has a long shelf life. It stays fresh longer. Uh, it's, it's typically pre-cleaned and trimmed into a nice fillet. So that can often be a more affordable option. So you know, looking at that uh, uh, and and realizing that there's so many different types of fish, it doesn't always have to be the most expensive types. So the sea, uh, you know, our super green list really highlights some fish that people may not be as familiar with and should try out more often, you know, so that they're often more affordable options. But it can be just little easy things, as I was mentioning, you know, uh, for example, canned uh, seafood, whether it's tuna or canned mussels, uh, albacore tuna or um, canned mussels, for example, you could put that on toast, uh, put it in a sandwich, put it on a flatbread, uh, toss it into to pasta, um, put it on a grain bowl, and then just even easier preparations when you're using fresh or frozen fish, just like sauteing it, uh, grilling it with j just a little citrus and herb seasonings, pan frying it. It doesn't have to be fancy or complicated. Yeah. There's, if I can add to that, there's there's sure. lots of options for fish that are pretty accessible. Um, besides the canned, of course, that's often the most accessible. Um, but um, you know, tilapia uh, can can be a good source uh, depending on where it's farmed. It's all farmed, um, and that that's usually pretty affordable. U.S. farmed catfish is usually a a pretty good go-to and and pretty popular in lots of parts of the country. Um, even your white fish, even your frozen fish sticks, maybe they don't have quite all the nutritional value, but they're still pretty solid and they're still pretty good for you and, and a, good, a good source of protein. 
Um, but a lot of times those, those sort of breaded fish sticks you find at the bottom of your freezer, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the grocery store, um, not always, but more often than not, those are, um, those are usually Alaska Pollock or they come from a, um, a fishery that that's fairly sustainable. Well, I think you even recommend as part of the super green list, you actually recommend products as in like, if you're going to buy some tuna, you actually sit, I, I just remember wild planet, for example, was one of the recommendations. So you're actually not only saying you can buy it in a grocery store frozen in a can, but you're also recommending companies that actually make a good product as well. Which, so, yeah, so, I mean, we'll post all of that on the, on the, on the, uh, on the website and on the uh, show here. So what, uh, any success stories, are there any statistics or kind of saying Monterey Bay Aquarium or Food and Planet, you've been, you know, working in the space for a long time and you've seen an improvement in health or you've seen an improvement in sustainability. Are there any, I guess, interesting facts or information as far as the success you've had over, you know, the last several decades with, with programs? I can um, add a little bit about the work that we've been doing with um, Food and Planet because we've really been focusing a lot on aquatic foods uh, for the last few years because we feel like it's such an important area because we're looking at all the aspects of sustainability, including human health, which is an important part of sustainability is that we're eating diets that actually promote our health rather than uh, deter our health. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, we have really seen some of these issues where healthcare professionals really don't, they don't even understand how to, how to utilize some of these foods. So we're trying to really educate the healthcare professionals who then can educate their consumers. And we're really seeing a lot more awareness among dietitians on these healthy seafood choices, in particular aquatic foods like bivalves and seaweed. We've been doing a lot of culinary work, uh, at culinary education demos, because you know, really there's not a lot of knowledge in that area. We did uh, surveys among dietitians to, to begin with and they found that they really didn't know a lot about some of these foods. So we have seen a lot of interest and you can start seeing some of these foods like the, the bivalves and the seaweed. You're seeing them on, on chef's tables now. There's more interest. You're seeing it all over as emer- on emerging food trend lists that algae and these kinds of things are growing more. Uh, of interest among uh, among the culinary world, and I think that usually transfers over to consumers. You're seeing more products with these, like for example, seaweed is getting more interesting. You're seeing it in chips and um, all sorts of snack foods now. There's kelp pickles. There's all sorts of sorts of interesting kelp burgers. So I think we're just seeing more of an interest in that area. Yeah, and I would, so I interviewed somebody, so at the uh, university here, uh, you're probably familiar with the Corbett University Hospitals in, in Cleveland, I interviewed their uh, director for nutrition, and they've actually set up a teaching kitchen for medical professionals. So as you're going through your medical school training, now this, it's an elective, it's not a required, but they had about a third of the students register for the class, so they're actually teaching them healthy cooking, what that means for their patients, so they can advise them not just on taking pill ABC, they can also advise them on, you know, healthy diets and nutrition as well. So I'm actually going to go, actually going to meet with her again next week. I'll have to see uh, if they're doing anything with seafood specifically. Teaching kitchens are an amazing uh, program. This way of introducing, you know, the education right at the level with, you know, that our health care comes from. You're seeing some really creative ways it's been introduced in hospitals where there's teaching kitchens right in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're inviting the community um, because we know that people are losing their cooking skills. We have now three generations in of people who never learned how to cook. We don't teach cooking and home ec classes in schools anymore. So there's a lot, a low level of competence around uh, culinary. So I think you know, providing that information along with our advice, you know, telling, giving people an easy cooking tip or a recipe along with that advice is very beneficial. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah, the, the food bank here in Cleveland, they actually have set up, they have like a grocery store setting and people go in and shop, um, you know, if they qualify in there, I forget whether it's once a week or once a month, but anyways, they have a teaching kitchen out front, so if they have fruits and vegetables in the back, they actually have recipes and they're making things in the front to say, here's how you prepare some of these foods. 
in the uh, center that we're going to build in East Cleveland, we'll have a teaching kitchen as well. So um, I, c I couldn't agree more on, on the cooking aspect there. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole conversation around um, whole foods, ultra-processed foods. I think when we talk about seafood and sustainable seafood and your super green list, uh, everything pretty much qualifies, in my opinion, pretty much qualifies as a whole food versus an ultra-processed food. So I think more people just in general need to be eating more whole foods, whether it's seafood, whether it's, you know, fruits and vegetables, et cetera. So I think that just kind of dovetails into that whole teaching kitchen again and just being able to how, how you can prepare those foods in a healthy way. Yeah, I would agree with you that the seafood really falls under that. You know, we have the, the four categories of uh, processing foods, ultra processed is the most processed, it's been the news a lot, it's linked with multiple health risks, and seafood really falls in that very minimally processed category mm -hmm. where we're, you know, we're really not doing a lot to it, uh, to the product, which is, we need to be eating more of those foods for sure. Yeah. So Corbett, this, this Blue Ribbon Task Force, so kind of how I got introduced to you through, uh, through Duck Cats, what, can you kind of explain what that is and what why you started that and you know kind of why you have chefs coming to to the monterey bay aquarium sure this is a this is a program that, that predates me as well it, it goes back uh quite a while actually um and the idea was that like i like i said before we sort of approach seafood and the buyers of seafood and the producers of seafood uh at different levels consumers and we're trying to we're trying to kind of come at the industry from every angle with mm -hmm. our with our sustainability messaging and we found that there are uh, a number of culinarians who are um, influential in their in their own right uh, who are very interested in in I wouldn't say being acolytes but certainly promoting sustainable seafood and um, we embraced this group of people um, to as they embraced us uh, for messaging and so we've brought the Blue Ribbon Task Force is what we call them. We've brought them into the um, uh, over to the aquarium a number of times, um, just for meetings, for cooking demonstrations, for educational seminars, and things like that. Um, and they tend to take these messages to heart, and they'll talk to the press, and they'll talk to their customers, and they'll they'll talk to their their buyers. Um, and try to make a difference uh, with through the supply chain from that angle, uh, and it's been a very successful program. We have about um, we have about sixty chefs uh, that we work with in some capacity, uh, and uh, have worked with even more through the years. Nice, and you actually have you have I, I guess the most recent one you actually had them physically out at the Monterey Bay Aquarium to kind of gather and share stories and. Talk about eating healthy seafood. Yeah, that's right. Very nice. All right, so what would you say is uh, next for, I guess, the Monterey Bay Aquarium and, and Food and Planet? Where, where do you see this going over the next? You've got the, this, you know, the current programs. The, can we look for something in 2025 or 2026? Or what, what are your thoughts on, on what's coming next, I guess? Well, we need to finish this year first. That's our first goal. <laughs> we still have five more super green species to release, which is um, a number of videos because we always have a partner talking about, uh, like a business partner like Patagonia or Patagonia Provisions, I should say, or um, American Tuna um, or Barnacle for, for seaweed uh, as part of our super green campaign each month. And then Food and Planet also puts together um, a great video with uh, one of their uh, dietitians um, preparing a, a, a healthy uh, seafood for that month. Um, and then they're also helping us with all these FAQs and all this language around uh, and understanding around the health benefits of each of these species, which is fantastic. It'd be great to um, to continue this in the future, but right now it's just envisioned as a as a campaign for our 25th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's an open-ended question. <laughs> Sharon, any thoughts on where Food and Planet and what you're trying to do here in the future? Yeah, we're, we're just loving working with um, Seafood Watch and, and developing these recipes. And what's been so fun is that we're working with so many different traditional diets. Uh, so the recipes are very culturally diverse, which is 
really showing how they're, you know, these seafood options are part of, of many diets around the world. So that's really exciting. Um, but we're, we continue to work in the sustainable seafood space, in particular blue foods, uh, as I was mentioning, the sea vegetables and the bivalves. So we're, we're doing more work in terms of analyzing the data because a lot of these, uh, these um, foods have not even been analyzed. We don't even have basic nutrition information on a lot of them. So we're working on projects um, and providing more um, messaging so that more consumers can find out you know, about their benefits, how to use them in the diet. And we're really hoping to do more culinary projects, more of that culinary education, working with dietitians to, you know, to, to create more videos and recipes because we find that to be really helpful and beneficial. Definitely very helpful. I just had a conversation with somebody that listens to my podcast. I had lunch with him last week. And he's like, okay, I'm going to start eating healthy. I'm going to start doing the right things. But I don't know how to cook healthy. I've never done it before. I'm, he's used to eating at restaurants or, you know, other establishments, but cooking for himself is not. So it's like, can you send me any place that has? So so the cooking demonstrations, I think, are, are going to be a huge future thing for yeah. uh, a lot of people that want to kind of eat healthy, basically. Right. I think so. I always tell people you can cook a meal, a healthy meal, in the same time that you could, like, dial up Uber Eats or door you know door dash Absolutely. or whatever and it gets to your to your door if, if, as long as you you know are you know have a little bit of preparation some healthy foods on hand hand it doesn't have to be over complicated i think that's the real message is that you you know you can do it you can fit it into your lifestyle absolutely which kind of leads us into our recipe and i, I guess Part of the impetus for this recipe is to try to, you know, obviously get people to eat healthier, get people to, you know, eat healthier at home, and kind of like what you said, it, it, it's not hard. I mean, if you watch a lot of television, sh popular television food shows, I mean, they're, they're making, you have very experienced chefs making very complicated dishes that taste fantastic, but the average person is not going to be able to recreate that. So that's kind of like, yeah, it's 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 fun to watch, but it's not realistic for the average person, I guess. So. So given that kind of backdrop, I guess I know you brought um, kind of the albacore tuna uh, recipe from the Super Green list, and I know it meets our under $25 um, family of four, has only a few ingredients that can be made in less than 30 minutes. And again, this is something, to your point, instead of either waiting in line at a fast food establishment or ordering through DoorDash, uh, something that you can make, and when you're making these meals at home, your your home smells fantastic because you're using different spices and ingredients and stuff too. So I'll let you share and just kind of just at a high level, we'll be posting the you know the link to Super Green as well as the link to the recipe in the in the video as well. So if you could just high level share that recipe, that'd be great. Yes, um, that recipe was developed by one of the dietitians we partner with, Andrea Mathis. She's an amazing um, culinary nutrition expert, and she did a beautiful v video. She creates the most beautiful recipes and videos, um, and it's a very simple recipe. It's just stuffed bell peppers. If you've ever had stuffed bell peppers, it's just super easy to just cut a bell pepper in half. And then it's got this creamy um, tuna filling using canned albacore tuna that has Greek yogurt. So it's uh, low in fat, low in saturated fat in particular. It's got some herbs and seasonings in there and you just fill the, the pepper shells, sprinkle a little shredded cheese and bake it. So, you know, you can have you know, a family of four could eat that. And it's, you've got a serving of vegetables, you've got some healthy protein on there, maybe have like some uh, whole grain bread on the side and you've got a meal really quickly and easily. Very nice. And I'll just, so in an effort, it's kind of in the same vein here to get people to eat healthier. We're um, sharing on the podcast and on the website, kind of a website. So it, it lists you can go in by state and then, you know, put in the month and say what is in season in my locality, um, you know, that I can buy. And there's plenty of farmer's markets all over Cleveland, all over the Midwest, all over the West Coast, everywhere. So you mentioned peppers. Peppers are in season now. So if you go to that website and kind of look it up, you can go to a farmer's market, buy a fresh pepper that tastes fantastic, or buy a couple of them for a couple of dollars, get your tuna, get your yogurt. I mean, it's just... It, you're using something that's in season that's going to taste fantastic. So uh, in addition to peppers right now, I'll just mention a couple other things that you can be buying at a grocery store uh, or a farmer's market and 
arugula, basil, cabbage, blueberries, blackberries. They just taste better this time of year. Carrots, cucumbers, lettuces, uh, garlic, onions, and then I add peppers on my list as well. So I just encourage people make that tuna recipe at home. Go to a you know a store that has local ingredients, not that's been shipped halfway across the world or something, and uh, you know make that recipe at home. Any final thoughts that you want to share, Corbett, Sharon, before we uh, wrap up here? I was just going to um, add for that for that tuna recipe, make sure you see the words on the tuna can that say pull in line cot. Okay. Or, um, or you might see something free school, or there's a mm-hmm. couple of different words you could look for. If you have, if you need any sort of advice on canned tuna or tuna in general, you can always go to seafoodwatch.org, and on the top right corner, you'll see something called Seafood Guides. Mm-hmm. And if you click on that Seafood Guides button, it won't take you to the super green information, but it will take you to information specifically about um, well, about a dozen different kinds of seafoods. Um, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about salmon, sustainability, or, or, or tuna. So I recommend checking that out. Well, everybody's got a phone in their pocket. They can easily, at a grocery store, access that website and pull up that information. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both for being on the show. Uh, Again, I'll post um, information about how to find, um, you know, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Food and Planet, so everybody has access to that, to the Seafood Watch list, uh, Super Green list, et cetera, so that'll all be available to all the listeners. So thank you both very much for being on the show, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thanks.